Amen. Thank you, choir, for those wonderful songs this morning. And again, thank you for being here. I turn your attention to Luke chapter 2. The Christmas story that we know best is the account that Luke gives to us in this chapter. And we want to look at it. Uh, we, I would love for us to look at it with fresh eyes. I don't know if that's entirely possible or not. But it is amazing how the Holy Spirit renews his word to us, renews the truth that he has revealed to us uh, afresh, and that the joy does not have to wane, the peace does not have to flee, the hope that this story gives us uh, does not have to be diminished, but it can grow, Amen. it can grow. Luke chapter 2, so familiar phrases like, in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, or this will be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Or there was no room for him in the end. We, those are all phrases that are, are etched in our mind. We, many of us have grown up hearing those words. We've memorized those words. We've recited those words. Sometimes the phrases roll off our tongue without much attention to the ironies and the profundities that fill these, these sentences. So let's slow down for a moment. And let's take a few minutes and look at the story again in light, of, in light of God's word, in light of what else God has said. As he tells us this story in Luke chapter 2, but honestly, it is a story that's told to us throughout the entirety of Scripture. It goes something like this. In those days, in those days, that is, in those days that were foretold by the prophet that a virgin would conceive and would bear a son, Emmanuel, Isaiah chapter 7. In those days when God, God's chosen servant, would make his appearance, again, foretold by the prophet Isaiah. In those days when the fullness of time had come. In those days when Christ, the Son, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, emptied himself. And it was in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. A human decree, yes, a decree from Caesar, the emperor, the most powerful man in all the world. From Augustus, whose name means the honored or glorified one. The decree went out from Caesar Augustus. But it was also a divine decree. A decree from the father, the one who chose before the foundation of the world to send his son to be born of a woman. A decree from the emperor that made way for Christ the king, for Jesus, the very image of the invisible God, the glorified one to be born. And so it was a decree that all the world should be registered. A decree that all Roman so uh, citizens and subjects should be accounted for and taxed. It was a political judgment. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. This was the first registration or taxing when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Quirinius, the Roman provincial governor, had the power to enforce this royal decree. But it was a heavenly decree that superseded all. For by the one born in Bethlehem, all things were created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. For Paul tells us all things were created through him and for him. And so moved divine providence that all went to be registered, each into his own town. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. The village considered too small to be among the clans of Judah. Because he was of the house and the lineage of David. So Joseph went to his hometown in whose dark streets would soon shine the everlasting light. He went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Mary, that one who is blessed among women, who bore in her womb the light of the world, the bread of life, the true vine, the way, the truth, and the life. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. A time when God would send forth his son, again born of a woman, born under the law, so that we may receive 
the adoption as children. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, the firstborn of God from eternity, has become the firstborn of Mary in time. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Mary wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. For we know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that by his poverty we may become rich. For he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant, the one who had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire of him. He who sympathizes with our weaknesses yet is without sin. That one was laid in a manger. Laid in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. He was despised and rejected of men, acquainted with grief. One from whom men hid their faces. Yet to this day, Jesus, who descended to the earth, stands at the door and knocks. And to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door, he enters and fellowships with them. And we're told in Luke's account that in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. For God chose, may I remind you, the foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world so that no one might boast in the presence of God, says 1 Corinthians. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with fear. But we see him who for a little while was made a little lower than the angels, Jesus crowned with glory and honor. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For born unto you this day in the city of David is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. In these words, heaven announces the wedding of heaven and earth and a single infant child. Here, heaven gives to earth the fullest expression of Emmanuel, God with us. And here, heaven tells earth the meaning and the significance of Christ's birth. Great joy will be for all people. A Savior is born, the angels sing. Glory to God in the highest and peace. And some manuscripts add, and I like it, goodwill toward men. Because Christ is born, there is glory in heaven, and there is peace and goodwill on earth. There, that is, the peace and goodwill of heaven has come to earth. They have been born in a manger, incarnate in Jesus Christ. The glory of heaven has spilled over into the earth and has brought with it peace and goodwill. And then we come to that announcement, continued announcement of the angels, this time in song. When a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God, joined the angel and said and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill among those with whom he is pleased. Let me take just a few moments here and let's look at what Christ's birth brings as the angels announced it. They bring to earth from heaven, they bring glory, they bring peace, and they bring goodwill. Glory. Well, glory is something that people earn, like an athlete competing for a championship, or one of the ancient athletes receiving a crown. It's something that may come as if by fate, like a general winning a great battle or a scientist making a new discovery. May be unpredictable, un- unforeseen, unintended, as if one almost seems destined for it. Glory can be momentary, as a student who makes a dean's list, or a vacationer who is taking in, the, say, the Grand Canyon for the first time. Glory can also be fleeting and elusive, as in the athlete that never wins the big one or an author who never writes a bestseller, or a politician who loses the big race. Whatever our human experience is with earthly glory, it's never as everlasting as we hope it to be. And indeed, it can't be. There will always be another dean's list. There will always be another valedictorian. There will always be another champion. 
There will always be some other award-winning achievement. Whatever record you may set will probably be broken. That's earthly glory. It's fleeting. It's elusive. Emperor Augustus, made famous, at least for us, by Luke, chapter 2, whose name means the honored one, or we may say the glorified one, the exalted one, he had his own choir of singers in his court who would sing his praises, who would sing glory to him. They would glorify him for the, the, uh, the incredible achievements, unprecedented peace that he brought to his empire. And truly he did. After centuries of turmoil and brokenness and the empire threatening to break apart, he had conquered all of his enemies and he was, was leading a peaceful empire. Or so they thought. But on this night, a different choir filled the air with praises. This was not a court choir. This was not a choir singing praises to, a, to Caesar. This was an angelic choir, a choir from heaven that descended that was sent from the Father to announce to the, the, these lowly, dirty shepherds, to announce to them and to sing to them these words, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And with that angel, the multitude of heavenly hosts sang the chorus, Glory to God in the highest, and on peace, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. To glorify someone or something means to, to adorn it with honor or beauty, to beautify it, to, to make it honorable, to, to set it up, to exalt it, to glorify. So when we glorify God or when the angels glorified God on that occasion, it wasn't that they were adding anything to his nature or his character. It wasn't that they could add anything to his beauty or his glory. But they were exalting, they were spreading the news of God's glory. When we glorify God, we, we exalt his reputation as our creator, as our provider, as our savior, and as our friend. The birth of Christ was the proclamation of the glory of God. John tells us this in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he says, and we have seen his glory. Amen. The glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. At the same time, the word in Philippians 2 emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. Glory appearing in the form of a servant. Glory. God gives glory to this world in giving his son to be born as a baby. Also, we are told the angels tell us that with the birth of Christ comes peace. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. This is something that the, the ancients of the Old Testament longed for. Longed for peace in the world. They longed uh, for uh, something beyond the peace that Caesar had provided for them. For it wasn't peace to them. It was bondage. Now, Luke is not merely giving us in the historical setting of Christ's birth, but he is he's consciously giving a contrast of the peace that Augustus had won for the empire and the peace that God brings to the world. Caesar had conquered his enemies one way or another, by death or by life. He had subjected his enemies so that on this occasion he could order now that they pay taxes to the kingdom. But God has conquered the last enemy, death, sin, hell. But even aside from the birth of Jesus, this was an exceptional time, according to the historical record. A national census in this empire didn't occur every 10 years like it does in the United States. A little bit later, uh, perhaps when Jesus was about 10 years old, they would make this a regular thing, and every 14 years there would be a census in the Roman Empire, but not, not when Jesus was born. This was something that was uh, just sporadic and perhaps somewhat rare. Each village, each town would 
set its own date for its registration. And so as we picture people making their way to Bethlehem, it, that was on the occasion in which the city leaders of that area had decided they were going to have their registration. Jerusalem would have their registration at some other day, and Rome some other day, and all the various cities throughout the year. It just had to be, take place that year. And so the travelers on the road headed to Bethlehem from wherever were people who not only were born in this city, perhaps, but primarily they were people who were landowners in this area. If you owned land in Bethlehem, you had to make an appearance. You had to register it anew. And so Joseph, who apparently was a landowner, was required to return to the city in which he also happened to have been born, as well as Mary. So here in the little village of Bethlehem is a territory the human race has never known. Here on that little piece of ground is where heaven entered earth, right. where God himself in the incarnate person of Jesus Christ and the fullness of time he came for God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law so that we might receive the adoption as children and to that the angels sing Gloria in excelsis Deo glory to God in the highest the, the glory that comes with God is not the glory of Caesar it's not the glory of a champion athlete it's glory in the highest it's the glory of heaven itself which comes to earth in the birth of Jesus Christ. And may I tell you that that is wonderful news for humanity and that is terrible news for Satan and unbelievers. The glorious coming of Christ. For we read in the letters of John, we read in these two passages, first and first John chapter four, he says this, he says that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. There is a fundamental difference. There is a line drawn between the confession that God has come and the denial that God has come. He goes on in his second letter, and he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. I am a follower of Christ today because I believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, Amen. that he was born, that he lived, that he died, that he was buried, but that he rose again, and he revealed himself, and he ascended to his Father, and he will come again. If I choose to deny that, what then do I believe? Because when heaven comes to earth, when it breaks in upon us, and when it promises glory, and it promises peace, and it promises goodwill, and all of those are things that we all long for and wish for for this world, but if we reject the giver of those, then what do we hold on to? Where do we turn to? What do we look to? Caesar? So the angels announced that glory, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, and goodwill toward men. And that's probably what we give most attention to in reality in our celebrations of Christmas. Goodwill. Now, I don't, I'm not talking about the store. Those of you who are, your mind just went shopping. All right? Bring it back here. Goodwill, the giving of gifts. Today... Every one of you should receive a, a gift from the church. Our ushers are ready to give you a little treat as you make your way out the door. And it's, it's, a, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of goodwill. It's a symbol of, of, of love. It's a, it's a symbol that in that little package that you'll receive, and perhaps some of you have already unwrapped gifts, or maybe you have a gift yet to give or to receive. In all of that exchange of, of presents, First of all, I hope it is done in goodwill. There's probably more entitlement that goes on at Christmas than any other time. I got you a gift, where are you going to get me? Right? There's probably more entitlement that happens. That's not what it's about. It's not about receiving 
something from someone else, our brother or our sister. It's about the fact that God has given to us something for which we ought to be eternally grateful. And, and because of that, because of the gift we have received from God, we are happy to give something. It's just a token of love to someone else and say, this gift right here, this gift represents something. It, this gift is not eternal, but it represents something that is eternal and cannot be achieved in this world. It cannot comprehend the glory and the peace and the goodwill that God has given to the world, but I'm, I'm going to give it to you. I thought of you because God thought of us. God thought of you when he sent his gift wrapped in swaddling clothes. And so the angels call us, call us to peace and to goodwill. And you know what? You can't really separate those two. Right. Now, the earliest manuscripts don't have the word goodwill in there. Some do. Some, some many uh, manuscripts do. And so uh, it may not have been part of Luke's original writing. But nonetheless, it is a very ancient tradition. And whether it was part of Luke's writing or not, the church, which has passed it down to us, has recognized that peace and goodwill go together. That's something that ought not to be separated. That when we show goodwill to someone that there ought to be the product of peace that happens. And guess what? God is glorified when that happens. So the angels bring to or announce to this earth glory in the highest and to us peace and goodwill that come from God. God the giver of glory for in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 we're told that we are awaiting an eternal weight of glory. An eternal weight of glory. What's that mean? What it means is this, and I alluded to this last week, and I will mention it again as we go through the year 2020. That God has so created us in his image that he wants to share himself with us. Now, there are words, uh, you know, we will use the word presence, we we'll use the word uh, sometimes face, uh, the Hebrew word for face will mean presence. But one word that's often used, we find this in Exodus chapter 40 after, after the uh, tabernacle had been built. And, and it says God, the glory of God descended upon that place. So that means his, his presence, he, he dwelt among men. And as we go not just through the, the end of this year, 2019, as we celebrate 12 days of Christmas here shortly... But as we go into a new year, I want us to think perhaps a little bit differently about the world than maybe you have in the past. Because when God sent his son to be born as a baby, he is telling us that in the end, he wants to make this world his home. Right. So how we treat one another how we view the world, how we treat the world reflects how we think about God's home. Glory to God in the highest, and that highest glory is coming to us in the person of Jesus Christ, and it will return to us. Jesus will return to us and bring with him the fullness of the glory of God, and we will dwell with him with the eternal weight of glory, and we'll share in that kingdom peace and goodwill unending with our Savior. And so on this fourth day of Advent and Sunday prior to Christmas Day, with, with the saints of all the ages... With the saints around the world, many who have little or nothing to give to someone else, the greatest gift we can give is what God has given to us, Amen. to share in the glory of God and give peace and goodwill Amen. to all. Amen. Would you stand with me? And let's pray a prayer in closing that that glory, peace, and goodwill will fill our own hearts and that God will send us forth to be peacemakers and givers of good things. Jesus, we thank you for taking on flesh and showing us the glory of God. And we look forward to a day, a second advent, a second coming, a second appearance 
where you will come in the fullness of the glory of God. And as John said, we will see you as you are. Oh, what a beautiful vision that will be of God who descends upon us and makes this world your home. Lord, I ask that as we have reflected upon the story one more time of your entrance into this world the first time, that our hearts will be so t in tune with your glory and the peace you give and the goodwill you show that we too will be channels for your spirit to spread the glory of God and his image around this world to be peacemakers, not strife makers, but peacemakers in this world and to do so by doing good to our neighbors as you have done good to us. Lord, I ask your blessing upon this congregation. I pray that your spirit would go with them through these days of Christmas and that you would be glorified and you'd be seen in our lives for you are and you bring glory in the highest. Blessed be your holy name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please come back uh, to the Wesley Manor tonight at 5 o'clock and we'll be singing together and get your treat as you go out.